Thank you all for being our first audience here at the Interval for our first salon talk in our beautiful new space. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, I, it's my honor uh, to, to welcome you guys here tonight. My name's Michael M. Uh, I'll be uh, producing this series of salon talks that we're gonna start having uh, on Tuesdays periodically um, here at the Interval. Uh, as you know, because uh, we're, while well, we have fantastic drinks tonight, everyone enjoying the drinks so far this evening, I hope? Excellent. Um, we're not fully open to the public yet, so this is a sneak peek at the space. A few last details are still coming together, uh, and uh, we're excited that we can start with uh, an amazing event like this. Uh, this is the first talk that Adam's giving for proof. This is its true book launch here, so uh, we're, we're thrilled that he's doing that for us tonight. Um, so I wanted to put a couple things in perspective about Long Now and this space. Um, first of all, can I ask uh, who here, well, first of all, how many of you are members of, of Long Now? It's fantastic. We've got a great uh, run of members here. How many of you came to an event, came to a talk uh, here at this space in its old incarnation or, or came to a seminar reception after one of the seminars we had here? So... Um, what we started to see over years was that something really special was happening in this space. And for those who weren't here, um, Long Now moved in in 2006 into what had been, uh, it was kind of a museum space. It was not a very well-appointed museum space. And Long Now had never had a public space before. The seminar series had already begun, but there was no uh, actual... Um, uh, you know, uh, ongoing public space. And so it was kind of an accident. The, the office, if you don't know, for long now is upstairs, so that's where everyone works. And so some displays got put up, and some books got put on the shelf, and the doors were opened periodically for people to come in. And that was good. Lots of uh, people, because lots of people come to Fort Mason for all kinds of reasons, came in and were introduced to Long Now. Uh, and over time, the exhibits got a little bit better and a little more interesting, but we also started to do more events here. Some of them were receptions, just welcoming our members and other guests back after, uh, after a seminar that we had here at Fort Mason. Um, we had a few talks, uh, folks like Kevin Kelly and Daniel Suarez did small talks, even smaller uh, audiences than this. And we started to see that there really was, uh, in the small group, something that was complementary and additional to what happens in the seminars where it's a larger audience and we have a lot of amazing speakers, uh, but, but something more intimate and something more personable happened here. And it kind of ties back to the very beginnings of Long Now. As some of you may know, really Long Now started with an idea and a conversation, which was Danny Hillis had the idea about what if we had a clock that only ticked once a year and how that would change the way people thought about time, the scale of time. Um, and he had this idea as a metaphor for long-term thinking. So he started a conversation. He sent out an email to some of his closest friends, Brian Eno, Stuart Brand, Kevin Kelly, Esther Dyson, uh, and, and others who would go on to become the board of Long Now. They would go on to found and start to build that clock and to create the Long Now Foundation, which is doing a lot of other amazing projects about long-term thinking. So, um, really that social aspect, that conversation, is at the root of the things that we do. And so in addition to having the larger forum that we have, to have a smaller audience here where uh, it is more of a conversation with the audience is something we're really excited about. So we've been spending the last year building this place. Uh, we decided when we knew that social aspect was really important for us, we needed to not just have an arbitrary place to have it, but to build a place that fit the organization, that fit the type of events that we wanted to have, and to start to have these smaller salon series. So uh, this moment is really uh, both an end and a beginning. And like the name, The Interval, which is a measure of time and a place out of time in a way, um, this is that 
interval uh, as we shift from what was the museum and store to something that is a salon, that is a bar, that is a cafe, uh, and that uh, we're bringing life to. So thank you so much for being here for this first inauguration of it, and uh, we're gonna have an amazing event tonight. I just want to say a little bit about how we found Adam and Adam found us and why this is our first talk. Uh, I actually, I met Adam in the middle of the desert filming a TV show that never was aired. Um, and uh, we were making up technology for the military. And, but we became friends because the TV show was clearly not going to happen. And um, we had to have some kind of catharsis. And so we, uh, we made fun of the TV show together that we were filming. And, um, and I kept in touch with him for quite a while. And when and I saw that he was covering a, the major alcohol beat for for Wired as a, as an editor there, and when we were starting this place, he, the first person I called was Adam. And I said we need someone to do a really cool uh, distilling project with. He's like, well, you have to talk to Lance. And so we went and talked to Lance, and we started this amazing gin program. And then the second time I called Adam about this project uh, was because I needed to find a really great beverage director and bar manager. And he's and, and then I also called Lance with that very same question. And both of them, our first response was, well, you should get Jen Collio, but you'll never get her. And so this is Jen Collio. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer is, uh, is also the creator of Small Hand Foods, which makes all the amazing syrups uh, and some of the drinks you have tonight, as well as uh, tonics. Uh, I think just got a, a you got nominated for an award at uh, Tales of the Cocktail this summer. Congratulations. Um, and so we've done our best to pull in the very best of everything here, and part of that is pulling in Adam, which uh, just uh, so happens coincides with uh, the his book, which where he tells the story of us uh, doing this whole gin program on page 209. Uh, so um, that's so far that's the only page I've actually read because we just got the book in. Uh, but he did also uh, he did also write the article about us in Wired, which literally came out today. And there's some free copies on the shelves in the back um, to complete the circle of you know inappropriate closed circles of people tooting each other's horns. Uh, so um, please grab one of those if you want. Uh, it's just now going to be hitting your mailboxes probably this week or something. Uh, and with that, I will uh, leave you with Adam Rogers. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's right. <clears throat> Welcome to the singularity of epistemic closure. Um, or just log rolling, I guess. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, Michael and Xander, thank you. You know, it's traditional to christen a new ship by breaking a bottle of champagne on the bow, so I guess it's fitting to uh, inaugurate um, a space like this with the entire weight of booze history and science <laughs> uh, and to launch uh, my book with the weight of deep time and the future of human civilization. Um, so, you know, no pressure uh, on anybody. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my publication day. This is the first public event for the book. So... Um, <laughs> So thank you for helping me, uh, for helping me celebrate that. I, I asked them to, uh, to put the flight um, on, the, on the podium. Podium, not dais. Dais is what you stand on. Podium is what you speak in front of. On the podium. Um, because the, these, these four glasses are, in a, in a very real way, a hologram for my book. Um, you know, a, a lot of people think about booze in categories, right? It's a perfectly good heuristic. Beer, wine, tequila, rum whatever, right? The, the individual things you can buy in bottles. But I, I tend to think of it more as a process. And so uh, this, this, this is it um, in front of you. you the, the invisible part over here is a, is a microbe that you can't see, is yeast, right? This is grape juice. Uh, this is wine, which is fermented grape juice, right? This is pisco, which is unaged brandy, which is distilled fermented grape juice. And that's brandy, which is aged, distilled, fermented, Grape juice. And then over here, in this invisible space, is the experience of tasting it, smelling it, the effect that it has on your body, the effect that it has on your brain. And then over here, very occasionally, is a hangover. <laughs> um, and, the, and the pivot point, right, the exact middle of the book, at least, not, doesn't really work for the flight. Forget that metaphor for a second. The exact middle, the pivot of the book is that moment when somebody like Jen serves you a drink, and you pick it up, and you take a sip, and you get that, that first experience of tasting it. Um, that's that's how the book is organized, and that's what I kind of want to talk about tonight. Um, I, I like the, uh, the tradition of having quotes from, from people 
you might recognize as a way to start a talk like this. So you might recognize him. That's Ben Franklin. And he has a, there's a famous booze quote, and it's usually, you usually hear it as, uh, wine is proof that God loves us. Which is really actually pretty profound, right? Because it gets at the idea that booze is some kind of um, intermediary between us and the divine, right? Or, I guess in the case of wine, between us and divine. See, I do some vines of the... All right, fine. <laughs> I regret nothing. Uh, but actually, it's a misquote. What Franklin actually said was that rain falling on grapes, which then made wine, was a constant proof that God loves us and wants, to be happy, wants us to be happy. Um, and, and that's actually even more potent, right? It's an even more intimate connection with the process, with the thing that nature makes. It's not my favorite booze quote. My favorite booze quote is from this guy. You know who that is? Faulkner. It's William Faulkner. It's 1954. He said, civilization begins with distillation. Uh, okay, so we'll be good high school English students about that for a second. The metaphor is a little heavy-handed, perhaps. Distilling is about boiling down, right, and getting to the essence of stuff. And in fact, that's the etymology of the word. That's where the word comes from, boiling something down. Not coincidentally, that's the etymology of the word yeast as well, from a different language, boiling down, boiling something. But I, but I want us tonight, I, I want to encourage you to be more literal about that. Um, the human relationship with booze is the story of how Homo sapiens becomes people. It's the story of how we settled down. It's the story of how we became civilized. It's the story of how we learned to use things in our environment and then learned to make something new in that environment. So, can I prove that? Well, uh, I'm going to tell a few stories in that vein to try to do that tonight. Um, the, the, the first one is uh, about yeast and why they make alcohol. We're going to talk about how people started using that process themselves, then how we invented something entirely new that used that process. Um, and then a, a, a story about how that all coalesced into the shining future where we all live now. Or, or actually more, more like how it didn't exactly coalesce. But we'll get to that in a bit. Um, and then the bonus story is one that Xander alluded to, which is about us tonight and about this place. So, start with the easy stuff. <laughs> Don't worry about this too much. Uh, this is, this is um, the yeast, uh, uh, yeast respiration. This is... Um, very close to the diagram that made me become a journalist and not a scientist. Because um, you have to memorize this stuff. But, but I, I put it up here because I wanna, I wanna start with a question. Why do yeast make alcohol? Not, not like philosophically, but existentially, right? Why, why do they do that? Um, this cycle is the cycle by which yeast converts glucose to energy. That's what ATP is, the green up there. It's what your bodies and yeast bodies use to make energy. But, but what we're interested in is actually those two arrows in the, in the black box. The, the black arrow going this way that says ADH1 and the blue arrow going this way that says ADH2. So what that box means is that yeast can use an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase 1 to convert a chemical called acetaldehyde into ethanol, which is the alcohol that we drink. And then they excrete that, for which we are all thankful. Everyone has a drink, right? That's, that's why you have it. The blue arrow says that yeast can use an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase 2 to turn that ethanol back into acetaldehyde. In other words, yeast can eat its own poop. That's what that says, right? Um, sorry, aldehyde dehydrogenase, not alcohol. They're doing that there. Anyway, all right, you get it. So, um, okay, so why does it do that? Either yeast makes ethanol as a local antimicrobial to kill off its competitors, its little, the microbes, right? You know, alcohol is really good to kill, kill germs, right? So either yeast does that, right? Because most things can't handle as high levels of ethanol in its environment as yeast can. Or yeast is making ethanol as an external food source. It's storing its own food, one or the other. So which is it? This is a scientist named Stephen Benner. Um, he, he does synthetic biology mostly, but he invented a field, he and his team invented a field called paleogenetics. But here's what he did. It, it works a little bit like the way linguists trace the origin of words by looking at the antecedents in other languages, right? You try to trace the word back up and up and up and see where the words come from. So what his team did is they got all the examples that they could of ADH1 and ADH2 from 
Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the brewer's yeast, baker's yeast, the yeast that's used to make the stuff that you're drinking, and some related species. They used them to build 12 possible versions of like a primordial ADH. Like what ADH would have looked like way back deep, 150 million years ago in evolutionary time. And then they used that, those enzymes to run the same equations. They ran the kinetics again to see which enzyme it was more like. So they had this ADHA, they called it. Was it more like ADH1? Was it more like ADH2? That is, did it make ethanol? Or did it, did it want to make ethanol? Or did it want to make acetaldehyde? Right. Well, it turned out that it wanted to make ethanol, not eat it. Right. It wanted that equation to run toward ethanol. OK, so problem solved. Right. The yeast are doing chemical warfare, essentially. They're making ethanol so they can kill their competitors. So I said that to Stephen Benner. I said, well, there you go. You got it solved. He said, no, that's, that's a just-so story. You can't do that, because actually, you see, yeasts eat sugar. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But yeast eat simple sugar. But 150 million years ago, grasses hadn't evolved yet, right? And sugar cane's a grass. There weren't flowering, fruiting plants yet 150 million years ago. So where were the yeast getting the sugar? They probably lived exposed to air on tree sap exudates, the little bubbly bits of sap coming off of plants 150 million years ago, right? But then, uh, and they were perfectly happy. Right? And they were making ethanol as a waste product because ethanol is really volatile. That's going to be important later, too. It evaporates. It really wants to evaporate much more than water does. So that's a good trait to have in a waste product. Right? It goes away on its own. It's a perfect sewage system. But then about 50 million years later, in the Cretaceous period, fruity plants take over from pine trees. Right? And yeast all of a sudden find themselves pre-adapted to live inside the fruit because they can tolerate higher levels of ethanol. Right? Those angiosperms, those fruity plants, meant genocide for any species that couldn't handle it. Or they meant that only some of the species that could handle it would go on, right? So that the dinosaurs who knew how to eat fruiting plants were what became birds. Everyone else was a planet-wide extinction event, the evolution of the angiosperms. But yeast, because they were already adapted to high levels of ethanol, could live inside the fruit, handle it just fine. It seems like they're pre-adapted, but that's just the just-so story. What they are is lucky enough to do what needs to be done in a changing world. Okay, so sometime after that, we come around, <laughs> moving forward a few million years. This is a shard from a pot about 10,000 years old. Uh, it was found by archaeologists at a Chinese site called Jiahu, uh, which is a really interesting archaeological site. It has some of the oldest evidence of rice being eaten as food. It has some of the oldest musical instruments. It has some of the oldest written language. It's a, it's a really rich site. This pot, when they found it, had some weird residue inside it, which eventually made its way to an analytical chemist named Patrick McGovern. He's at Penn. McGovern ran a whole bunch of tests, Feigl spot tests, gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy, UV beams, shot lasers at it, did everything he could in his lab, and eventually found the ingredients of that residue. So he, he found three things. He found essentially oils from beeswax, which only comes from one place. You get that from honey. He found evidence that rice had been pulverized in the pot. And he found tartrates, tartaric acid. Um, so for anywhere else, at any other time, that would probably have meant grapes, um, which are really high in that stuff. Uh, but while there were some wild grapes in China 10,000 years ago, um, it, they, there weren't that many. And they, they weren't vitis vinifera, which is the only species that we used to make wine from. But they probably were more likely it was hawthorn fruit, which is, uh, I asked him what that would taste like. He said it was like a chalky apple basically, but, it's, but it was fruit. And what, <laughs> what McGovern realized he had, he didn't find ethanol, I should say. As I mentioned, it's really volatile. It's evanescent. You never find evidence of the actual booze. You just find kind of the evidence of the evidence. But McGovern put all that stuff together in his head. And as he says, you'd have a hard time not letting that ferment if you mixed all those things and left it in a pot. It would want to ferment on its own just because of yeast in the environment. This pot held the mother Eve of booze. This is humanity's oldest known intentionally alcoholic beverage. 10,000 years. Uh, think of the ingredients. It's rice, like in sake, right? It's honey, like in mead. It's fruit, like in a wine, all mixed together. This is the f oldest evidence that we have of us trying to make something good to drink. <laughs> right? um, he, uh, I asked him if I could hold it. And he, um, it's just in his office. It's on his shelf. But I asked him if I could hold it, and he got very nervous. And he took out nitrile gloves and put 
the gloves on, but I, but I got to hold on to it. And it, I've never held anything that old before. It was it, very profound, this connection to somebody else who just tried to make some stuff, you know, home brewer, right? Um, but that's how long we've been doing this, at least, right? Harnessing this natural process to do what we want it to do. This is us domesticating yeast while yeast domesticates us. Please give me more sugar so I can make you this thing that you like. Right? Okay, so uh, that's about 8,000 BC. I want to jump forward to about sometime between you know, 500 and 1,000 BC. This is what happens next. Not exactly next, right? 8,000 years later in Alexandria, ancient Alexandria. Because this is when we move from using that natural process to inventing a technological one, to, to us making something new. Um, this is the, a sketch of the first, uh, I, I pronounce these badly, my ancient Greek is terrible. Uh, a, a keratakis and a tribikos. These were invented by a woman named Maria the Jewess. Um, she was the inventor of alchemy. She was the, she's the one who, when the medieval and renaissance alchemists were trying to figure out how to turn lead into gold, she's who they read. Um, she's the inventor of a bunch of laboratory techniques and laboratory materials. You know what a, a bon marie is, a Marian bod, right? The double boiler used in labs? It's called a bon marie because it's Maria's bath. She invented that. This is another gadget that she came up with. She figured out, well, I might undercut this in a second, but she figured out that you had to use... Uh, metal tubes, she figured out they had to use solder, she figured out that it was better to use copper, um, and she probably wasn't using it to make booze. What she was probably doing was putting stuff like sulfur and other metals in there, right? We, still, we get the term spirits from this. They were trying to get the spirits that were resident in every material object to come out. She wasn't trying to figure out something good to drink, she was trying to figure out how one thing became another. The alchemists are a weird breed because a lot of the techniques and approaches that we use in science today come from what they were trying to do. Right? They were trying to understand the natural world through experimentation. But their underlying philosophy was like totally wrong. So it's hard to, it's hard to, it's controversial whether to attach them to modern science. But these are the first scientists, right? Now, I love this because I don't know how much you know about ancient Alexandria, but it was, um, it was the first modern city. Alexandria was built on a gridiron designed to take advantage of prevailing winds. It had a giant lighthouse that they built a causeway to get to. They loved automatons. They liked machines. They were robot builders. They liked uh, gadgets where if you opened a temple door, the statue at the other end would move and catch the light so it looked like it had a sun halo or that you could put a coin into a fountain and, and robot birds would sing a song. This was the first city of engineers, right? They were, they were not just scientists, they were technologists. So I, I, love the, I love the story that this is where the still comes from too. And, um, just because I like the idea that engineers did it, it's a new technology. Um, Patrick McGovern, who I mentioned before, doesn't buy this at all. He thinks that the first distilling happened in China. Um, but I like this story better. Uh, and um, uh, it's also not crazy because the next places where you start to see distilled stuff come up are all trade routes that originated in Alexandria. Um, so you, you start to see some of the Arabic words coming out of Alexandria that we now associate with alcohol, like Alcohol comes from alcohol because they were making makeup in these stills. The alambic still comes from alambic, which is the Arab for what this thing was built, right? Um, now, uh, what we know about Maria actually comes from a guy who wrote about her a few hundred years later. There are other examples of people saying that they had something that looked like a still in history. Um, like I said, I just, I like Alexandria. And I, what we don't know is whether they actually made booze in this thing. Most historians will probably say no, but I tend to think that her lab was a lot like any graduate lab. There's booze in the graduate. I mean, come on. They're gonna, you're sitting there late at night, you're like, we can put the beer in it, see what happens. I don't, you know, we'll try it. Um, okay. So uh, that sort of brings us to the modern era, kind of. So I, I, I have another story from there that, that tries to stitch these together, at least in a broad sense. I, I will ask a question to start, though. What do you think the most important molecule on Earth is? You have to have a favorite molecule. Come on. You, 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 I know. This, 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 say it again. Water. Everyone always says water. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think it's water. I think that giving water the award for best molecule is like giving paper the award for best book. I think water is 
you'll excuse the use of this phrase, the medium, not the message. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with this. Do you recognize this? That's, that's glucose. Simple sugar, the simplest of simple sugars. Six carbons in a hexagon, some oxygens and hydrogens dangling off the corners. Why? Okay. Sugar's power. <coughs> Just about every form of life on Earth uses this stuff as fuel. There's a lot of energy stored in those chemical bonds. But sugar's also structure. So you can assemble molecules like that, like Lego bricks. Right? You get that, the, the, that's a monosaccharide. You can have a disaccharide. You can have polysaccharides. And you get more and more complicated sugars. You get things like sucrose and fructose, and then you can get bigger and bigger from there, one after the other. If you connect those glucose molecules together in a slightly different way, with a different kind of bond, you get the most common organic molecule on Earth. You get cellulose, wood, paper, right? Use a different bond, connect them in a slightly different way again, you get starch, amylose or amylopectin. Okay. Uh, sugars, th I love this part. The sugars are, are, they're literally the backbone of our genes, right? DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. The ribo in there is ribose. That's, it's a sugar molecule that holds that double helix together. Most important molecule. Way better than water. <laughs> What's the matter with you guys? Uh, okay, so that's all neat. There's one more reason. Sugar is what these guys eat to make alcohol. Right? That's yeast. That's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Close up. You can't see it here, but you can see it there. Uh, it's actually more etymology. Saccharomyces cerevisiae means sugar-eating beer maker. It's a little on the nose, right? But <laughs> fine. So here's the problem. We humans can't digest cellulose, right? It's a, termites can do it, cows can do it, we can't. We can't digest starches, right? We have amylase, an enzyme in our saliva that starts that process. Yeast can't. Yeast are stuck with a diet of simple sugars. This is like just one or two unit sugars, usually. So that's great if you have easy access to a source of simple sugar and you want to make booze. Uh, grapes are really good for that. Full of simple sugar. Yeast love grapes. Apples, great for that. Before there was beer and whiskey in this country, it was all cider. It's nothing but cider, because there were tons of apples and you could ferment them. Honey, fantastic, right? If you want to drink mead, there's mead here. Honey's great for it. But uh, actually, on the grape thing, uh, there's a researcher at uh, Dalhousie University named Sean Miles, and he, he came up as one of, kind of the first people who was interested in studying grape genetics for wine. Um, he, he said, you know, if humanity had first settled, instead of in the Fertile Crescent, where Vitis vinifera really took hold, had settled like on a Pacific island someplace, we'd have hundreds of species and varieties of coconut, and there'd just be one grape that nobody would care about. Uh, but he, he wanted to breed hardier, when he started his career, he wanted to get into genetics, so he wanted to breed hardier uh, grape varieties, like things that were more disease resistant, maybe more flavorful, but he couldn't get any traction um, because everybody wanted, nobody would buy the, the grapes. Uh, everybody wanted, you know, the, the, the same names that are familiar to you that they grow on the banks of the, the Loire and the Rhone. Um, he, uh, he, he described it as grape racism. Um, he got in apples instead. There's more money in apples, he said. Okay, so if you have access to those things, great. You make booze, you're golden. But what if your most easily accessible product of agronomy packages its sugar as starch, right? What if it's barley, it's grain, if it's rice? You have to turn the sugars in those, the starches in those, into sugar for the yeast to get at them. You're adding value to that. It's much easier to take a big barrel of booze down to market than it is to take all the barley you just harvested. That process, that conversion of starch to sugar is called sacrification. And this is the way we do it in the West, malting. Right? We take barley, and it used to be they would do it at any distillery, place like that. Now it happens mostly in big centralized facilities like this one. This is Glen Ord Malting in the north of Scotland. It's owned by Diageo, which is a big transnational drinks company. They, they process 83.8 million pounds of barley a year. It's like six or seven truckloads every day coming in. Um, it's, uh, it only takes 11 people to run the whole facility, uh, but it runs 24 hours a day, every day of the week. Um, it's, a, it's a cool process, actually. It's a, it involves germinating the barley seed. It grows a little bit, because that starts the biochemistry that makes the enzymes that converts the starch, and then you use that stuff that has the enzymes in it to convert other things. Um, and basically, every starchy thing that we ferment or distill uh, in the West has malted grain in it of some kind, often malted barley or enzymes that come from that process. It's a time-intensive process, it's expensive, it's critical, you have to do it. Unless you're making sake, 
If you're making sake using rice, you do something entirely different. There's no centralized facilities. It's just like the old days of, of distilling and malting. They do it in a sake brewery. Um, they uh, polish away the enzyme-making layers around the rice. That's bran. makes rice brown. They polish that away. They just get the white rice. And then they expose the rice to a fungus called koji. Well, that's what the black stuff is in that picture. Uh, it's a, the Latin name is Aspergillus arisei. And I don't know if any of you are mycologists, um, but if, uh, if you hear the, the, uh, the genus Aspergillus, that might make you a little nervous because most of those guys are bastards. They, uh, they make stuff called aflatoxins, um, which are both a toxin and also carcinogenic. The clinical literature includes phrases such as bloody ball of mucus in the lungs. Um, <laughs> they're really horrifying. Uh, but, um, but not koji. Koji's tame. It's domesticated. Uh, what koji does is makes all the proteases and amylases, all the stuff that breaks down proteins and breaks down starches, none of the toxins. It's the core of Asian cuisine. They use it to make sake and soy sauce and vinegar and tofu. It shows up in Chinese records as early as 300 BC. So this is where this guy comes in. This is a chemist named Jokishi Takamine. And um, Takamine was born in 1854 in Yokohama. Um, he was one of the first kind of exchange students that, that Japan mounted up after um, Perry opened up trade. Um, he was an exchange student in Edinburgh, he spoke English, um, spent some time in the US, married an American woman. And he thought, he, his job was to find new businesses, new, new international trade for Japan. And he thought that, that, um, that sake would do it. He was interested in sacrification. He, he thought that whatever the stuff was that was converting starch and rice into sugar could work on other grains would work on stuff like barley. And now, so this is an amazing insight for somebody in the late 1880s because people like the Buckner brothers were still trying to figure out what enzymes were, right? Like nobody knew what that chemistry was yet. They were still inventing biochemistry. And this guy said, I don't really care, but I think we can commercialize this. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, after years of research, he figured out how to make koji grow on rice bran, that stuff that the sake makers were throwing away, so it was super cheap, right? and he could extract whatever the active ingredient was. It was an enzyme, he didn't know, it was alpha amylase. He didn't know that, it didn't matter. He could extract it and use it to convert starch in barley also. Um, so he, uh, and he actually, he came to the US. He, he, uh, it took 48 hours and made more sugar, the process was better, more sugar to distillers, more money. Um, he had, unlike most scientists at the time, Takamine had no compunctions about patenting things. So he patented the process. Depending on how you count such stuff, these are the first English language biotechnology patents. First time anybody tried it. He patented it. The Whiskey Trust in 1891, which were the people who ran basically all of distilling in this country until prohibition happened, hired him, moved him to Peoria, Illinois, and had him build a facility to industrialize the process. That's where they were based. That's why, that's why Peoria. They were in Illinois. Um, and, uh, uh, and they asked him to move from Japan. Joan Bennett, who's a mycologist and, a, and, and, and his biographer in English, basically, she's done most of this. She did this research. Um, she says that uh, Takamini's mom and his wife didn't get along in Japan, so he was more than willing to move. They're like, yeah, we're out of here. She was like, let's go. We're back to the States. Let's do it. I know it's Peoria, but we're... she grew up in, in New Orleans, so Peoria was probably a little bit of a... Anyway, you get the idea. Um, but, so eventually he builds this full-scale plant. He builds a facility from malting, malting, right, barley to make whiskey. It was cheaper. They were going to make a lot of money. He had a good deal. Everybody liked this idea except one group. You know who? The malt men. <laughs> the people who ran malting were not so happy about this. So one night in October 1891, uh, Takamine gets a phone call. Um, this is how the Peoria transcript reported it the next day. Uh, the fire at the Manhattan Malt House early yesterday morning was the most peculiar one. It's only by sheer luck that other buildings were not destroyed. When hose company number six, at whose house the alarm was turned in, reached the scene, the fire, though blazing brilliantly, was confined to a small frame tower and under favorable circumstances could easily have been extinguished. They lay a line of hose, but so great was the distance from the burning building to the nearest hydrant, the hose would not reach. <laughs> and the crew had to stand about until the arrival of hose number four, who completed their line. The water was then turned on, but to their extreme disgust, the firemen found there was no pressure. So that's funny. Uh, my emphasis added, obviously. Um, I, you know, there's no evidence that this was arson, but it was a setback. He did actually manage to rebuild. He managed to produce a, a cheap, um, not a single malt, but a zero malt whiskey um, called Bonsai. Again, a little on the nose. Um, 
but the relationship eventually soured, it ended up with legal battles, it all fell apart. He, he was never able to use what he called takakoji to replace the malting process. Um, but I, I don't want you to feel too bad for him because he, he turned it around. He took that stuff, he re renamed it taka diastes, for diastatic, and um, sold it as a cure for dyspepsia. It was, Joan Bennett says, it, it became the Alka-Seltzer of the 1890s. It was a huge hit. Um, uh, so big, in fact, that the pharmaceutical company Park Davis bought it from him here. They set him up in a lab um, and set him on the challenge of isolating another wonder drug, another miraculous chemical, which he sort of sent a lab assistant out to go copy from another lab, and then they came back, and then again he patented it, and he named this stuff adrenaline. He figured out how to find that. Um, again, an early biotechnology patent that was so profitable that it actually got him sued and got Park Davis sued. And it was a decision in that case by a judge named Learned Hand that said you could indeed patent the products of a natural process that was okay, that is still today the basis for the biotechnology industry. All came out of this. And Takamine. Uh, he got rich. He bought a five-story townhouse on the Upper East Side. Um, <laughs> became a kind of an unofficial commerce ambassador for Japan. Um, and... Uh, started a couple companies, helped found the National Science Foundation equivalent in Japan, got so rich that in 1909, it was his money that paid for those. 2,000 cherry trees on the tidal basin in Washington, D.C. So, all thanks to the parallel universe of sake that, <laughs> and whiskey that never happened. I like this story because it suggests a world out there in the quantum foam of the multiverse where we make booze in an entirely different way, right? Where the, the stuff in your glasses doesn't, didn't come from the same process that that evolved over those millennia and over those 10,000 years. Um, it sort of came true. People have done experiments with drinks that were almost entirely but not quite unlike beer. Um, in Japan, they call them haposhu, like half alcohols, because they charge, they charge taxes based on how much malt you had, not how much alcohol was in the final drink. Apparently, they taste uh, like they have alcohol in them. Um, you could base them on peas. You can make them from pea starch. It's very strange. Um, but the, I, I bring all that up because I, like, I love the story, but also because it, it's an indicator of how deep our relationship with all of these methods and microbes and technologies go, that you try to change it and it just doesn't work. This is the way we make this stuff because we're connected to it in some intimate way. They're very hard to change. Uh, which might be why um, about, I guess, a year and a half ago, as Xander said, he sent me a note asking if I could think of somebody who might be able to make a drink that would fit with the mission of this place. Um, something that you could serve at a bar space he was, at that point, thinking of building that would hint at that 10,000-year relationship and that would um, also indicate its future, talk about some way of our, our connection with this natural process. I said, Xander, how did you know I was working on a book about this stuff? And he said, I didn't. I just, you're just kind of boozy, right? Like, that's you're just... <laughs> It's a fair cop. Um, but I actually had somebody in mind. Those are the stills uh, at St. George Spirits. As Xander said, I suggested that, um, that Lance Winters uh, would know his stuff, be able to make something, and also know his science. So we trucked over there, and I, I, I went to that meeting too. The question was what to actually make. So what I pitched was by Joe, was um, uh, distilled sake, basically distilled rice wine. Um, the, the oldest historical evidence of a distilled spirit that you drink comes from uh, Chinese literature about food. Um, so I thought, well, that was, that was the most historical um, thing I could think of. And, uh, and Lance said, no, because it tastes terrible. <laughs> so I said, no, we're not doing that. Um, but, uh, but then uh, Xander told him, Lance, about this place. That's the Mount Washington site um, where the clock, at one point where the clock was going to be sited. And, and and Xander said, you know, it had two important features. It, there was juniper there, grew juniper berries, and there was bristlecone pine, which can grow to be thousands of years old. And Lance's eyes literally got wide. I've never seen that cliche happen before. It's a true thing. It happened. His eyes got big. And here's the, here's the quote. Here's what he said. He said, if you were able to send some juniper berries, he's got a little, a little a small still that he uses for experiments. He said, if you were able to send some juniper berries, I could run them through and see what they show. If there were some way to get some needles from a bristle cone, too, you could say you had needles from a 5,000-year-old tree. And Xander looked across the room at him and said, how much would you need? Uh, because one of the things St. George does best is gin, and gin is what you make from juniper. So they went up and they did a harvest and got the pine and the juniper berries. Um, this is, maybe we, we'll move out what... Uh, I'll ask Jen to come out and Chalbin, and we can move the, uh, the taste of this now. Is that... Yeah. 
Um, so, uh, so what they're, what they're going to pass around now is a, a taste of what Lance actually came up with about two months later. Um, and we'll vamp while that's getting passed around. Because um, I, want, I want Jen to come around and talk to you about what these are going to taste like. Um, and also what else she's going to be serving. She'll, she'll be right out. I will say, too, that I would encourage you to taste it before Jen starts to talk and get a sense for yourself of what you think it tastes like because here's a trick you can play on your friends. If you give them something to drink and tell them what flavor notes they are going to taste in it, they will taste those flavor notes in it. <laughs> um, that is how profound our psychology is wrapped up in what we taste and smell in this. I, have to, I, I know what I taste in it, but as it comes around, you guys taste it first, and then um, and Jen will come out. Um, so what I'm hoping you'll talk about is mm -hmm. um, uh, what you like about the gin, and after they get a chance to take a sip, what you taste in it, and then talk about the, the menu here in general. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So um, hi, thank you so much for coming to uh, the first talk, and especially given that um, both Adam and Lance are the reason I have this job, <laughs> which is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> um, I did, or uh, Adam recorded a podcast with me about, God, it has to be about four years ago now, yeah. something about something like that over at Wired. Um, that was our first contact, and um, uh, it's just, it's super exciting, and you know, um, we send each other nerdy, nerdy emails sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Lance as well. Um, so uh, yeah, the 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 foraging trip that the Long Now staff did was before I was hired. But I've seen the pictures and um, talked to Lance about it. And um, if you've never actually gone over to the St. George Distillery, it's fantastic. It's just a wonderful tour. They do. They have a tasting there. It is an absolutely gorgeous distillery. And Lance will distill anything. I mean, he. <laughs> I, I, I mean, really, he will distill anything. He threw a bunch of crabs in a still once. Like, he just, I mean, he'll, he has uh, seaweed distillate. He has... Um, foie gras some, or foie gras. He, there, he has a foie gras distillate. Um, uh, there's some... There's he's a little a, of alchemist a, in Lance. Yeah, too. there's a porcini mushroom distillate that's out of this world. Um, there's some other things that I don't know if I can say. Mm -mm. <laughs> going to stop you right there. Nope, do that. <laughs> Uh, but he's just, he's a, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. And his, um, his uh, uh, perspective about distillation is that this is the best way we have of preserving something natural. So you can take, um, you know, a, a, a pear, say, and you can eat it fresh, but that's only going to last fresh. If you pick it off the tree, it's not going to last for very long. You could make it into a jam or a butter or something like that or a syrup. And um, it will last for quite some time, especially if you, you know, fill it and preserve it and, and, and that kind of thing. But, that, but distillation, it, uh, assuming you can prevent um, oxygen from getting in, will last indefinitely. And if you do, if you distill correctly, the smell and the flavor of this, of this distillate will be exactly what it smells like when you smell it fresh. And it captures a very narrow slice of what the pear is, but... Uh, the, but in terms of how we experience it, this, um, this very true, um, authentic sense of it. And that, that is the skill of the distiller. So um, the Long Now staff went, pe picked these juniper berries. They said, uh, for my discussions with Lance, um, I don't know if you guys have seen juniper around here. It grows around here a lot. And it, even if you pick it off the tree, they're still kind of hard and small, and they're like, it's like gravel, you know? Um, they, they said that they, tasted, that, that they felt and tasted like blueberries. They were so moist and so plump and this incredible um, uh, flavor and so not, not as, as kind of um, volatile and aggressive as I thought of juniper berries. And they would eat them straight. So Lance said, sweet, I want to distill it, you know, immediately. Um, and he wanted to really capture the essence of what that... Um, of what those juniper berries were. Now, we all know that gin is made from, is like distillate from juniper berries. Uh, there's a, a number of other um, uh, herbs and spices that, that you might use. Um, almost always, um, uh, actually pretty much always as far as I know, uh, coriander seed, orange zest, lemon zest. There's some other ones, orris root, uh, you know, um, apricot kernels, things like that. Um, but they're not, those are used in kind of smaller amounts. And Lance found that when he just used the, those four ingredients, so mostly these juniper berries, some coriander seeds, some, some lemon zest, and some orange zest, 
um, that he got to really capture the the full you know fragrance and and taste of these fresh juicy juniper berries. I don't know if you see in the picture, but there are some you can see some little pine needles that are in there. Those are actually cedar tips that were captured while they while they were harvesting for them by hand. So that got into the gin as well. So you might taste and smell a little bit of cedar. Um, but other than that, it's a very clean, it's a very clean gin, and I think it speaks to um, Lance's uh, uh, skill as a distiller. Was that, did, I'm curious what, what you all tasted in it when you had a sip. You can just, you can just shout. And do those, do those <laughs> flavors come, come through or anything else come through when you take a sip from it? Or, or, did, or have we retroactively influenced you to only taste? <laughs> what, what you are tasting. <laughs> That's right. I taste a lot of the orange peel when I taste it. I think it's a really like, sort of right, light citrusy. Um, I think it's great. Jen insists that it makes a great martini, so we'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about the rest of the menu, what else you're going to sure, be serving uh, the, for, for tonight or for the interval in, in general? For interval in general, I okay, think. Okay, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, one of the things that really excited me about the prospect of, of doing this was the, um, the idea of time and um, this longevity. Um, I've always been attracted to, to legacy and lineage when it comes to cocktails. I find it's a really easy way of engaging an audience. You get people to try drinks that they wouldn't ordinarily have tried if they have a compelling story. And um, the way that the bartending community across the country and even across the world kind of feeds off each other and makes each other's drinks. And, you know, when I go into um, Eric Elistad's bar, The Coachman, you know, he'll, he, he might make me a drink that he had in New York. And, uh, you know, I, I may be Facebook friends with this bartender in New York, but I don't know him personally. And there's this transfer of information. But a lot of it... Uh, comes from this um, legacy of before prohibition and through prohibition. So the opportunity to do a menu that wasn't just here's our 15 cocktails, but to really expand on these ideas of both um, both time and history and story uh, was just really exciting to me. So the cocktail menu is um, is several pages long. Each page is um, is one um, either a theme or a uh, or, or an evolution of a drink. So I have a section on martinis, which goes back to the original martini, which was from 250 years ago, and it was a mixture of Geneva, um, white wine, and cinnamon. So you can sort of see how that evolves into our modern martini. There's a number of different stopovers along the way, the Martinez, the, the gin and it, you know, there's, there's, it's great. There's, it's so interesting to me. And I think that um, having the opportunity to lay out the stories and explain these things um, is just a way of engaging people and getting people excited about, I don't know, things that have excited me for quite some time, <laughs> you know? So um, I hope you, uh, yeah, I definitely hope you come back and experience it. And, I think, they've, I think they've opened an important bar. Um, but I'm the sort of person who thinks bars are okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so is everybody sufficiently lit to wax philosophical for a minute? We, uh, I, I just got back from a two-week family vacation in Japan, and um, I went to uh, the old Imperial Bar at the Imperial Hotel. The Imperial Hotel in Tokyo was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and it, uh, as many Frank Lloyd Wright buildings do, it mostly fell apart by the 60s. Um, so, uh, <laughs> thanks, Frank. Um, but had very beautiful pieces. The last pieces of it, the last Wright fixtures at the Imperial Hotel are in this bar upstairs. So I, I wanted to go see it. And it's like Japanese cocktail bars are, are finicky, crazy places, so I wanted to go see it. I went, that's their house cocktail, um, which had... Anyway, it wasn't that good. It was called the Gemini. Don't worry about it. But it had a beautiful coaster. <laughs> um, so I, I took that picture. Getting it, I think, what, what Jen was talking about, that the sort of, we, we tell ourselves, we, we repeat to each other the history of our relationship with alcohol, often through the cocktails, through the things that we, that we drink. We tell other histories, this history of Frank Lloyd Wright in Japan, through, the, through a drink that we can have at a bar. Um, you know, human beings had the technology to make gin a millennium before they understood why that technology worked why the gin tastes the way it does, why it makes you feel the way it does. And there are still questions about all of those things. That, this science is unsettled. It is my favorite kind of science. Right? It is where the action is. Once you answer a question in science, it gets boring. This, these are places where people are still trying to figure out the optimal way to run a still. Ethanol is the only recreational drug for which a mechanism has not been articulated in our brains. Nobody knows why it works. Nobody knows why it makes you feel the way it does or why it makes people from different cultures feel differently. 
we make this stuff that affects our senses, and it alters our bodies, and it changes our minds, and we all taste it a little bit differently. Every one of you would have a different description of how that gin tastes to each other. Um, and sometimes you would be trying to describe the same thing in different words, and sometimes you would be trying to describe different things with the same words. We have finally, in the past 100 years, started to crack open yeast and other microbes that are responsible for this process, begun to understand the biology that makes the run, that drives the product. We've started turning those microbes and the substrates that they work on from kind of the gross, unpredictable business of domestication and husbandry into a more cold, a colder precision with genetic engineering. But, you know, we humans were making booze before we had any science, much less the science of booze. Um, now we have some of that science. We understand these drinks more, not completely. Um, and I, I'll, I'll make a straw man argument a little bit and say that for some folks that would make these drinks less magical. For me, it's quite the opposite. Um, I'll paraphrase Arthur C. Clarke here. Magic is really just advanced technology, right? You know, this, is, this science is how we make this magic. So my point that I'll end with is to say that when you were tasting Long Now Gin or any of the other drinks that Jen is making or any other drink, I don't want you to just pick up hints of juniper and cedar and dried orange peel. I am saying that you are tasting, as Faulkner said, civilization. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, that was wonderful. Um, so, uh, and we're going to have some questions for you guys, so think about your questions. I'm going to sneak the first one in yeah. since I've got the microphone. <laughs> um, so, we were talking a little bit about alcohol books earlier mm -hmm. and uh, the ones that are treasured ones on our shelf. Um, and you told some stories from the book and, and kind of framed it for us, but I'm curious... What do you see the, the use of your book? Do you see it's going to be, I do think it's, I mean, it's, it's full of great stories. Do you see it as something that people are gonna thumb through for references? Are there, are there, are there facts in there? What, what, do you, what do you see sort of the, the, the life of your book for, uh, uh, for, for somebody who's a cocktail nerd or? or I, I've been saying for a while now that I, in the process of reporting and writing this book have become the world's most annoying person with whom to have a drink with. <laughs> I'm terrible now. I just, you can't, don't, don't. Anybody complaining tonight? Oh. <laughs> I don't think so. So far, you're pretty good. But, so what I, I, I feel a little bit like, this is going to sound like I'm denigrating. It's quite the opposite. Like, it's a, it's a, it is a thing to talk about while you're having a drink. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I had this email with a, there's a bartender in Portland named Jeff Morgenthaler. And he, he blogs a bit. He's, 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 a, he's a great bartender and came up with a lot of interesting innovations at his bar. He works at a place called Clyde Common. He has a book coming out this summer, October, now, like June. Tomorrow. Tom oh, tomorrow. <laughs> Jeff's book's coming out tomorrow. We, we've been, Mark works at Wired, too. We've been looking at it at Wired. And, and I know Jeff a little bit. Through, this, through the process of, of reporting on the book, I went to go meet him. He's like, oh, you got to go. I want to go kiss Morgenthaler's ring. And, um, and, uh, and we were talking about the book. And... and we were talking about some other booze books that have been influential on us. And uh, so, that, you know, uh, Six Drinks That Built Civilization was one of them, and uh, there, there were some others, Wayne Curtis's book. And, uh, and I, uh, I said, man, if I ever get to go to a bar and look up at that top shelf where sometimes they have books and see my book next to yours, I'm going to feel like I won the Nobel Prize. Like, that would be, that would be lovely to me. Um, I, I, I also hope that it's a way that this is a way to bring science home to people. Like, I, I, I do have a bit of a highfalutin educational mission, and I, I want people to see the wonders of science everywhere. So this is a way for, for me to sort of sneak that into a drink, you know, sort of the, a, a spoonful of ethanol making the medicine go down. Um, <laughs> because I want them to see that in a bar. You know, when you go to a bar and you taste this stuff, I want you to be able to look at this and go like, oh, man, that, that's 200 million years of evolution and... 10,000 years of nature and 2,000 years of technology all coming down to me being able to pick this up and take a sip, which I love. It's a long answer. All right. Who's got a question out there on the front row? You're on a desert island. You get to have one cask of booze of your choice. What would you pick? <laughs> My desert island booze. <laughs> I do have it, but before I answer... Um, I no, no, it's not, it's, it's not laughable, it's just expensive. But, um, but, it's, but, but 
But another thing that did happen to me is that I, I now, not only do I not have a usual, I have the opposite of a usual. I am now the sort of person who, as I said, perhaps quite annoyingly, walks up to a bar, stares at the back bar for an inordinate amount of time, not when the bartender's busy, I swear. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't do that. And, and, and eventually sees a category of things that somebody has clearly edited very carefully, and I say, give me the weirdest one of those. I want to taste the weirdest thing you have back there. So that is now the person I am. Like I said, super annoying. But Desert Island Cask, there's a particular single malt whiskey called Springbank. Um, they, they still bottle an 18-year-old, so a bottle of Springbank 18. We had it at our wedding. Um, it's still my favorite thing in the world to drink. Other questions out there? Might not be right so there. good on a hot desert round, actually. Is I, think yeah. that, I, might, I might do a bourbon. Do I have ice? Do I have ice? See what happens? Annoying, I said. You, you can cover it with some coconuts. <laughs> okay. Coconuts. Maybe I want a rum agricole. This is complicated. Uh, so, Jim asked this of cocktail, but, you know, like, you don't show Yeah, I mean, you, you see a lot of, um, a lot of, I, iconic and historical significance of alcohol showing up in, a, in cultures again and again. Like, right, one of the things that Osiris does in Egyptian mythology is give barley, right? And, the, and one of the things that archaeologists and anthropologists love to argue about is the, the, the controversy is bread versus beer, right? Is well, why do we start growing barley? Was, was it to make beer? Was it to make bread, right? Um, and, and a lot of, there's, so there's a lot of, um, the iconography of the gods involves a lot of barley and maybe booze making um, in a lot of different cultures. And, and in fact, um, you know, the, 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 the cross-cultural stuff, it doesn't quite get to what you're saying, but um, becomes more and more important as you want to try to study alcohol's effects. There's a book, one of my favorite books that I came across in reporting was a, a, a book <laughs> wonderfully titled Drunken Comportment. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Drunken Comportment is a, is a cross-cultural anthropological study of how different cultures deal with alcohol. And, and it, the, the, the thesis of it, it walks right up to the line of saying that alcohol doesn't have any intrinsic effects, that it's all about expectancies, what you think it's going to do. In some cultures, alcohol makes you more violent. In some cultures, if you're drinking it with men in the afternoon, you become sleepy. But if you're drinking it with women in an evening thing, you become more active. And, so, and, it very, and, he, and, and the book finds example, counterexamples for everything. And, um, uh, it's probably not true to a certain extent because it's all kind of 50s and 60s anthropology, so they weren't always with all the men or all the women. It has some issues, but it was an interesting first, tr first pass at trying to understand how different cultures respond to this same stuff. And the fact is that all of us respond to it differently. It, it, it plays a central ritualized role in almost every culture, um, but what that role is varies uh, widely. On the front row again. The, the question was about, was about um, makers, especially distillers, uh, moving along, a, a, I guess, almost a continuum from, from taste specifically to smell. And it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating question. Almost every master blender or master distiller, they work almost entirely on smell. Um, and, and, and that makes sense, right? Because, of course, if you're just using taste, you're really just getting five, four, five, four five six maybe um, flavors, right? You just get that bitter, sweet, salty, uh, sour, maybe umami, semi-controversial, um, and uh, there, may be, there may be others that the mouth does, fatty flavor perhaps, but, um, but, but everything else, everything else is all your nasal epithelium, is all, your, is all neurons dangling down straight from the brain through a bony plate kind of right behind here, sticking straight down onto molecules coming off of whatever it is you're smelling. It's the most direct sense. Everything else is intermediated. But, but, but smell, man, smell is like you, it's parts of your brain touching the world. It's really wild. Um, it's why when you're concussed, often you lose your sense of smell because the bony plate moves and it shears off those neurons like Play-Doh spaghetti. It just, and you, that's it. You're just now all you got is salty and bitter. Good luck with those. Um, uh, but Lance, actually, at St. George, once told me that he learned more about, he learned more about distilling from uh, perfume books than he learned from any distilling book. He's very, his, his sensorially, he's all about smell. And in fact, if you, if, if you spend as much time with St. George spirits as I have, <laughs> um, you begin to, you begin to, you can smell something and go like, oh yeah, well that's, Lance made that. So yes, so very long yet, yeah, yes. Yeah, so. I like it. All right, uh, Adam, thank you so much. A round of applause for Adam.